Hi, everyone. I'm Robert Stephen, VP of Strategy and Sales at Shard Secure. Welcome to today's webinar, MicroShard Technology versus the Software Supply Chain Attack. The surge of recent software supply chain attacks have put a new focus on securing the software development lifecycle. A software supply chain attack occurs when malicious actors access source code to inject malware or other mechanisms that enable unauthorized access and persistence inside yours or your customer's environments. Your source code can also expose encryption keys and access credentials that can arm an attacker with the tools they need to inflict a potentially massive data breach. Microsharding is a new data security technology that provides defense in depth for your source code by ensuring it's incomplete, has zero value, and contains no sensitive information at rest, effectively mitigating the risks of certain supply chain attack vectors. In today's webinar, we'll cover the anatomy of a, supply, a software supply chain attack, how microshard technology works, how microsharding can be implemented into your existing software development practice, and how Shard Secure protects our own source code. Panelists for this webinar are Shard Secure CTO and co-founder Jesper Tomo, who has over 20 years of experience in building cybersecurity solutions for the enterprise. Jesper was a founder of a company called Two-Face Commit that is focused on helping companies with secure software development and offers expertise in identity, authentication, authorization, and integration. He was also the co-founder of Nordic Edge, an identity and access management company acquired by McAfee in 2011. Co-presenting today is Shard Secure's senior security engineer, Zach Link. With over 20 years of experience in the IT security space, Zach Link has a broad and deep knowledge of network and endpoint security. Prior to his role as security engineer at Shard Secure, Zach served at security leaders including Silence, Zscalers, Checkpoint Software Technology, and as a senior security engineer at AT&T. He's helped countless customers deploy cutting edge technology to improve their security infrastructure and strategy. This webinar will be recorded and available for on-demand viewing after this session. With that, I'll pass the mic to our first speaker, Zach Link. All right, thanks, Robert. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Zach Link. I'm a senior security engineer uh, for Shard Secure. And today I will be going over the uh, software supply chain attacks and how micro sharding your code can help secure the development pipeline. So, what is a software supply chain attack? Uh, in essence, it is another attack vector. So instead of phishing or exploiting a server vulnerability, the attacker embeds malware into legitimate software that you end up installing yourself. One thing that makes it such an attractive attack vector is not only the potential scope of the attack, potentially infecting hundreds of companies with a single attack, but also that people inherently trust commercial software. Um, a few years ago, uh, a security company I used to work for was doing an IR engagement and found a signed printer driver from a major printer vendor that had malware embedded in it. Our customers swore up and down that we were wrong and it was a false positive. They just could not fathom how a major vendor could be shipping malware and the discussion pretty much ended there. Fast forward to a few months later, the printer vendor reached out to us directly and admitted that they had been breached. Uh, they asked us how we found the malware in the first place. Uh, in the end, they became a customer of ours and included our tool as a mandatory part, a mandatory part of uh, their dev pipeline. So here is a simplified development pipeline. Uh, there's a lot that goes into creating software from writing code to building and deploying code. Uh, there are vulnerabilities throughout the pipeline and the attack surface is huge. Uh, you have developers committing code, build platforms, test platforms, packaging and signing tools, as well as a distribution and update platform. But the attacker just has to find a weakness in any one phase of this pipeline. And once the attacker infects any part of the development pipeline, the kill chain is essentially the same as any other type of attack. Uh, but the actual impact is generally larger since they might be infecting hundreds of companies with a single attack. So here are some examples of high pro profile attacks and where they fit into the development pipeline. 
Most of these are probably familiar to you, uh, but notice how each one attacks a different weakness in the development pipeline. This really shows how wide the attack surface is and how difficult it is to secure. Uh, for example, the VGCA and, and Veraport attacks both exploited the deployment phase of the pipeline. They didn't alter any of the legitimate code, but they were able to embed their malware into the distribution platform so that any customer who installed the legitimate software also got malware installed uh, at the same time, basically piggybacking that malware into, uh, into the installer. Uh, Burson worked a little differently by tricking the build platform to use an attacker supplied library instead of the internal library that developers expected, simply by making a public package with the exact same name and incrementing the version, the public version was preferred to the local version by the build platform. Uh, the latest is now our evil uh, ransomware from the attack on Kaseya which from what I understand uh, was attacking the update mechanism of the VSA product. So just by upgrading your existing application, the ransomware is downloaded and executed as part of the update process. Uh, they are evil indeed. Um, I don't know if any of you uh, caught this, but the are evil website uh, just went down in the last day or two. So uh, hopefully that's some good news. <clears throat> so you're, you're probably thinking, so what? I'm not a software uh, vendor. Why should I care about this? Well, when, when people hear software, uh, software supply chain attack, they automatically think of software vendors and open source software. Uh, while that is the strict definition, every enterprise I've been involved with does software development. In fact, you probably have developers on your own security teams who develop code. Uh, maybe it's to do integrations or automations. Uh, maybe it's you know for more complex tasks. So regardless of whether your organization actually sells the software you create or not, you still have customers using that software. They just happen to be internal customers as opposed to uh, external commercial customers. Now, the attackers don't care who uses the software. I mean, certainly the attack is larger with more customers, but the vulnerabilities and attack service are, are the same in, in either case. So um, it's really important that everyone who develops code be aware of the risks and vulnerabilities in their development pipeline and take steps to protect it. Um, I, so I added this slide uh, because Google just announced this a couple months ago. It is basically a proposed secure development framework uh, developed by Google called Salsa. And Google has been using this internally for uh, eight years for all their production workloads. Uh, but what I like about it is that it covers the whole pipeline and identifies the attack surface and how to secure it. Uh, the framework is generally more around policies and procedures rather than tools and technologies, uh, but I think it, it provides a lot of value. The way it works uh, is basically a tiered framework. Uh, so, you know, in short, if you do these 10 things, you hit tier one. If you add, you know, these five more uh, processes, then you hit tier two, and uh, there's a total of four tiers. Uh, but this framework is uh, very well worth reading and potentially adopting for anyone trying to uh, secure the software pipeline. So, the big question, and what we're going to show you today, is how microsharding your data can help protect your dev pipeline. Microsharding your data can help protect your source code, your object code, and any software packages while at rest. It also helps ensure that they haven't been tampered with. Basically, it ensures that your data at rest is both secure and private. For the last 30 years, we've been using one security control for data at rest, and that's encryption. Uh, yet encryption is only as secure as the implementation of it, uh, particularly in the cloud. The implementations are much weaker than when we managed our own keys ourselves. So if you use encryption and never have to actually manage a key, uh, that to me is a red flag that the encryption implementation might not be uh, as secure as you think it is. So let's take a work. Uh, let's take a look <laughs> at how microsharding works. Um, instead of using encryption to secure data at rest, we go through a process of shred, mix, and distribute. So first, we want to shred uh, the data to eliminate uh, any sensitivity of it. 
So in this example, we'll take a 400 byte file and we will compress it down to a 320 byte file. And at this point, we break it into micro shards. Uh, the default is, is four bytes. So you can kind of think of this process as like a cross cut paper shredder, uh, which you're all probably familiar with. And um, so the whole file is broken into four byte micro shards, meaning there's uh, 80 pieces. So after uh, shredding the data, we then mix it to eliminate any value of the data. So I've numbered all of these uh, micro shards uh, sequentially. And what we do is we create new micro shard containers. Uh, these are, you can think of them as a file, uh, but basically we create as many as you have storage locations configured. So in this case, in this example, I'll be using four. But what you can see is that um, any piece of data Let's say it took up uh, four micro shards. It was 16 bytes or so. It took up four micro shards. You can guarantee that each one of those micro shards are going to be uh, in a separate micro shard container. And the micro shards that are in that container are not going to be sequential at all. They're going to be randomly distributed throughout there. You'll also notice uh, this red box, which is actually uh, poison data. So you can um, inject poison data into this. We, you know, usually it's a very small amount, under 1%. And that makes it really hard to reassemble the file. It's, it's already very difficult and that makes the process harder. You would have to get all the micro shard uh, containers together. You would have to uh, figure out how to uh, unmix that data and put it back in order. And then you would still have to uh, figure out um, how to remove the poison data from that to even decompress that file. So the microshard containers, uh, they basically just look like files in, in, uh, in storage. So when they're at rest, uh, you'll just see a UUID uh, for the file, for the microshard container. And uh, it does not retain any uh, file headers, any file names or extensions. And it's also uh, has no location uh, information about where the other related microshard containers live. So even if an attacker was able to compromise one of your storage locations, they'd have um, just fragments of files that are all mixed up, uh, basically unreadable and unusable, and they would have no context about what kind of data that is or where the rest of it has been distributed to. So after the shredding and mixing, the final step is to distribute the data. So we were using an example of uh, four uh, storage locations. So you have your four micro shard uh, containers and they, you can get, send these to uh, any storage locations you configure. Uh, we support uh, on-prem, we support single cloud, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, and you can mix and match these storage locations as much as you want. Uh, but the main thing being at, at any of those locations, uh, that, that data is totally unreadable and unusable. So uh, how does this fit into your environment? So um, Shard Secure is deployed as a um, uh, software appliance. So basically an HA uh, load balance cluster. And you access it uh, from the left-hand side of this uh, your, your code servers, your application servers, uh, database servers, et cetera, can just access it sort of like a, a NAS front end. You can use uh, any of the supported protocols. Um, so S3 is very common, iSCSI. You can also use NFS or SMB and just treat it like a remote uh, file system. The shard secure cluster itself then manages uh, shredding, mixing, and distributing that data out to your configured storage locations. And um, again, we support uh, single cloud, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud environments, as well as uh, on-prem storage. Um, this is all done in, um, in parallel. So um, instead of saving one file, you're actually saving uh, a multiple uh, smaller files. And so sometimes this can actually increase performance. Uh, it's sort of an added benefit uh, on top. And I, I know of very few security products that help secure your data and then actually give you a boost on performance. So um, you know, very unusual. And then when the file needs to be reassembled, uh, the reverse process happens. And, and a key thing here is that um, when the file is stored, we actually do a, a SHA-256 hash of the file and that is stored only on the cluster itself. 
uh, not at all in the storage location. So when the file is uh, reassembled on the cluster, we actually do an integrity check using that SHA-256 hash and, and make sure it matches 100%. So if there was any sort of tampering at the, uh, at the data at rest in the storage locations, even if a single bit was flipped, uh, that would not pass uh, our hash check and that file would be, um, you'd get an error message that the file is uh, corrupt. Zach, do you mind if I ask a question about the previous slide? Sure. From an attacker's perspective, it, it appears that they would have a bigger challenge than just compromising the identity of an administrator uh, for these storage locations and that they potentially have a spatial challenge. How is this, how does this affect the risk of storing code in the cloud? Yeah, so um, definitely attack is is much more complicated. Uh, you would have to compromise, um, you know, multiple platforms, uh, multiple credentials, um, you know, privileged accounts, uh, even to get all the data. And then once you got all that data, you would still have to figure out uh, how to reassemble that data, how to um, get out all the poison data, how to put it all back together to actually get um, a file, um, you know, that anything usable, any sort of usable data out of that file. So um, it's an incredibly complicated process. Um, we've actually done a study with a, with a university and uh, essentially it's a, it's a lot more difficult than trying to brute force AES-256 encryption uh, mathematically. So um, we all know that's, that's pretty tough to do. So. Excellent, and can this solution be used with encryption or is this a replacement for encryption? Yeah, so I think that there, um, you know, there's definitely some um, weaknesses in, in some encryption uh, implementations, you know, not the algorithms themselves. Uh, but that being said, you know, we're big proponents of defense in depth. So um, uh, micro sharding your data, we can use uh, client side encryption, service side encryption. We're basically totally transparent uh, to the encryption process. But obviously, you do get that defense in depth and that someone would have to um, circumvent both of those controls, both the micro sharding and whatever type of encryption you're using to make it even that much more difficult. So now that you know how it works, uh, I just want to give you a quick example of, of what micro sharded code actually looks like. So I actually took on the left hand side, you'll see uh, git.c. I thought that was an appropriate file. Um, and that's how it would look like stored um, at rest. Um, on the right is the exact same file, but it's actually been micro sharded. Um, so technically this is really just a quarter of the file because I had four different storage locations configured. So you would actually have to uh, get all four of those uh, micro shard containers and try to put this back together. But you can see there's really kind of no relationship uh, from the micro sharded data back to the original data. So in short, by micro sharding your data, all your data, not just source code, but object code and, and distributable, pack, distributable packages, uh, they're protected from leaks or tampering while they're at rest. Uh, they're also private from uh, admin accounts, privileged accounts, cloud providers, or any attacker that is using stolen credentials for them. Uh, the attack surface is reduced, uh, meaning that you can confidently focus your security efforts and resources on the other aspects of your development pipeline. And uh, as, as I pointed out earlier, microsharding can also work transparently with any type of encryption to give you defense in depth. Um, but the last point I wanted to make was that there's, there's no silver bullet in, in securing the supply chain. Um, in fact, you probably can't secure your whole pipeline with even three or four different products. Uh, development is complicated um, and you really need a comprehensive approach to address all the risks. So uh, Shard Secure, you know, we can help you with uh, definitely one facet uh, of securing your, your pipeline. Uh, so with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, someone much smarter than I am. <laughs> so here is Jesper Tomo, the CTO of Shard Secure, and one of the brains behind the technology. Thanks, Zach. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I think you're also adding a lot to the, the team. You know, we're a, big, a team that is working in both the development and the engineering as well. So 
as Zach mentioned, I, I've been uh, uh, I'm CTO and, and I've worked with this for about three years now, uh, building the software from the prototype all the way up to production. And we have a dev team in Sweden that is uh, working on on developing this uh, uh, software. Uh, so for uh, as um, as Robert mentioned, I've been working with enterprise security software for about the last 20 years. So uh, Zach did a good introduction on how it works, uh, and I'm going to explain a bit more on how we are using it and how it works uh, and how it looks for the actual end user. And as you will see, this is one of the use cases. Uh, it could be a lot of different other data that you want to protect in the same way. Uh, and we'll mention a bit about those as well, but this is one of the things we've seen uh, so far, that is, is a very uh, good use case for, for a lot of customers. And I think as Zach also mentioned, even if you're not a software uh, company, you do uh, have a lot of source code. Uh, if you look at most of the cloud service vendors, I don't think there's anyone, any customer of any cloud service vendor is, that is just using that uh, cloud service. You probably need to add some of your own uh, custom code on top of that to make sure that it works exactly as, as you as a customer want to use it. So before we go into that, I'm going to go through two different uh, protocols that is uh, essential to uh, the way we uh, allow access to the data set. And the first one I'm going to talk a bit about is S3. And you've probably seen this in, in different cloud service services out there. Uh, it was introduced by AWS in in mid 2000, uh, 2005 or something for, and it's been uh, used by quite a lot of different, both uh, service providers, as well as products that has been implemented in this API on the client side. So it, it's uh, widely used and very extremely well-documented and it's a huge API, you know, it, it's as simple in the beginning there and it, it's fairly simple to do object upload and download. But if you look at the whole API set, it has a lot of different features uh, and things that you want to implement if you want to support the whole API. Um, it is an object storage. Uh, so it means that you store objects uh, into a, what they call a bucket. So you throw in whatever you want in there. It could be any type of data. You can put in source code in there if you want. It could be HTML code. It could be binary data. It could be um, any type of data that you want to store. But it is an object store, which is uh, uh, different maybe from the file storage or something that is used by a, a, a product that wants to read and write data in chunks or, or things like that. We have put it as a default API in Chart Secure, and it was a decision taken uh, a while ago because we saw that it had a lot of advantages to use this uh, as a default. And also because we saw that if we try to mimic that and use our own API, have to translate back and forth to the S3 API, that, that was uh, uh, it was a challenge to get the performance we wanted out of it. And that's all, always a question we get from customers. Uh, how is this affecting the performance? So we wanna be up there and make sure that we perform as well as if you would use an S3 API directly or, or any of the other products. And that's something uh, Zach also mentioned. We do multiple read and write, uh, we do parallel read and writes, which will gain some of the performance that we need in our uh, service to do the sharding and emerging because that will take some, some CPU to do it. And uh, the compression part is also very important when it comes to performance because that some, uh, not in all cases, but in, in most cases, if we can uh, get the data size down a bit. Uh, if you have an already compressed data set, uh, like an image, we usually don't get that much of saving, but it will obfuscate instead and, and, and do it even harder to merge it back again. But uh, if you have a source code, for example, which is usually a text, regular text files, uh, you can save a lot of space by using compression. There are a lot of different SDKs uh, in all major languages. Uh, AWS is supporting most of them as, as I've seen, and there are other ones out there as well. But if you're using anything like Java, C Sharp, or or Python, there are already existing SDKs that you can use. And um, there are some other vendors as well doing different types of, of uh, ways that you can connect. There is also, a, this is a REST API in the, in the bottom of it that you can actually use yourself. And I've seen some people who, who 
code directly into that REST API rather than using any of the SDKs. It's also supported by a lot of different, as I mentioned, service backends. Uh, I think IBM is purely based on the same S3 backend as, as AWS is. Uh, if you look at their APIs, they're using, they just took the SDK from AWS and renamed some of it, but you can see it's the same thing. Uh, and there are also products supporting this uh, when it comes to as a client using a uh, read and write into S3 buckets. And this is just some examples on how it could look. Uh, these are uh, mostly configured through either uh, configuring files like the GitLab you see in the top left there, you add some data into uh, how to connect to the backend. And the, the big difference, if you're using AWS, you usually don't uh, specify this uh, endpoint. That's the thing that is different from, from uh, when you use our backend, you will specify an endpoint, but you can use the same SDK or the same configuration as you use for, for AWS. And there's some other ones here as well. Some of uh, graphical user interface where you can add in these same things, but it's always the AWS service URL that you manage to, to point to something else. This one is a CyberDuck. We'll see that later in a, in a short demo. Uh, I'm gonna do at the end as well. You can see how it works. That was the S3 API. So let's look into the other one that I wanted to talk a bit shortly about. It's called iSCSI. And iSCSI is uh, Internet Small Computer Systems Interface. And it's basically SCSI commands on top of TCP. So you can use that to have a network storage. And it's basically set up of an initiator and a target. And the initiator is the operating system or the, the uh, client that wants to connect or add that storage into its service, and the target is the one that's, that um, exposes that, uh, that data disk. So if you look at this one, uh, the initiator is supported uh, out of the box in Linux and Windows. So you can use that to connect to it and it will look like a disk to the operating system. Uh, so it's just that you attach the SCSI disk in, uh, physically into the machine, but it's using the, the network to to communicate back and forth in between the initiator and the target. But that means that it opens up for a lot of different products because the way we use this, here we'll see that later on is, uh, when we talk a bit about we, what we've been doing. Because S3 is basically an API that is supported by, uh, we, we talked about the supporting there and it could be things like uh, backup or restore products like Commvault or, or Rubrik or um, even Splunk for, for logging. Uh, but if you look at the old fashioned uh, products or databases, they don't usually support S3 and for different reasons, uh, the protocol might not be suitable for that type of data or email systems or document management systems or databases. Uh, and then iSCSI is another option that you, can, that you can use for that. If you look at how we implemented this, uh, we have uh, a, an overview architect on, on the on the right side. And if you look at the top there, you will have that operating system, it is Linux or Windows uh, that runs the initiator and it connects them to the iSCSI target, the short secure iSCSI target. And it communicates from the initiator to the target via, via TCP and the default port is uh, 3260. So the operating system thinks that it has that disk attached and it can read and write to it whatever data it wants to read and write. And what happens is it writes it, the, the operating system writes it in blocks and the blocks is created in clusters. So we get that cluster data from the uh, our implementation of the ICSA target into our backend. And we use S3 to connect to the backend to our service. And that's where the sharding happens. So we get that kind of a uh, data blocks in the cluster and that gets sent uh, back and stored in S3. And we use that data then to shard it out to the different locations where you, where you configure as uh, a cycle showing. That could be different um, as you saw on, on his overview as well. It could be in any of the supported backend services that we have, and it could be at least four locations is what we recommend. Um, that's where you should put it. And this also enables us to support SND and NFS. Uh, so what you do is you open up an uh, iSCSI disk on a 
Linux or Windows, and then you use that one to export it as NFS or, or SMB. Uh, so that can be then used by other applications that connect into it. And it also gives us a database support. Uh, so you can run a database on top of that. And uh, we've been testing a couple of different ones and it works perfectly on top of them, like MySQL or, or Microsoft SQL as well. So by the way, I saw that um, um, Robert was uh, writing in the chat that if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will summarize everything at the end and take some of those questions and try and answer them for you. So uh, just for, for uh, looking into what type of services you wanna protect when it comes to this. And uh, if you look at cloud services, the kind of the use case that we've seen is, uh, is maybe the, the place where you wanna put this type of technology, uh, mainly because it's public by nature. As easy it is to set up an S3 bucket, as easy it also is to check the wrong box, which open up the, the bucket for access by anyone. And that type of failures we've seen from some companies, it happens. Uh, it, it's uh, something that, that that can be not by uh, uh, by somebody accidentally just open it up. So that, that's important. Uh, also that we've seen there are a couple of different, especially if you're in Europe, there are some different regulations like Cloud Act and other things and GDPR. And in US you have other regulations that might prevent you from storing sensitive data into the cloud. Uh, uh, different vendors. And this is a way to actually uh, uh, get the data to a sensitive level where you can actually store it up there and still use those type of services. Uh, another thing is when you do use those uh, hosted uh, or managed services, you, you don't have any control over your data. This is independent if you're a, a, a company using those services or if you're a private user. If you look at all the things that you use as a as a private user, you might use social networks like Facebook or, or Instagram or these kind of things. And you don't own the data, you don't have any control over it. You just produce it and they own the data set that you produce. And there's, as far as we see, not too many services have a, a, a way of bring your own storage. It's kind of their own storage that you use. You can't bring your own. There are a few Samples of that, I think that Salesforce has a couple of different ways that you can actually add in your own S3 storage into their services, because that's what you want to use or uh, do. You want to use their service because they have a, a service that you want to use, but you might want to still own your own data that is being accessed by the service. Um, and that, that's probably going to happen uh, in the future, but as far as we see now, there's not too many who wants. And probably the reason is because they want that data. That data is important for them because that uh, is something they want to use to to uh, enhance their uh, their value offer. Uh, if we look at the different ways you can uh, store source code, uh, either you use a managed service like GitHub. There are a couple other ones as well, uh, where you sign up for a service, they manage the whole thing, and you just store your source code into that. And it could be either an open source one or it could be a a, a company using it as well. Uh, or you can use a hosted one. And the hosted one, the, the most common ones are GitLab and Bitbucket and also in, in some cases, GitHub Enterprise. So it's a bit of a difference there when you use managed or hosted, but um, the same thing goes here. If you use a managed uh, service, they will store the data set for you. You don't have any way to use the managed GitHub service and store that source code in your own uh, own storage. Um, one thing I just added at the end there is uh, I've seen that there's some articles about this GitHub Copilot, which is a kind of a machine learning AI uh, service that they're adding on, which is going to go through your source code and give you recommendations. Um, and Zach just mentioned now that this, this has been trained on all the public code repositories that is out there. Um, and it means that if you would open up uh, for Copilot, that will be getting access to all your source code. That's the only way you could, could use that. So that's a bit of a challenge I, th I, I see for, for uh, customers to use. As I mentioned also, this is the source code is probably not the only 
place that you want to protect, the only data you want to protect. You have other way, other parts as well. You have the artifacts to where you build all the software together uh, as a bundle. You have the pipelines, as Zach mentioned. You probably have a lot of other data sets like your wiki, doc, uh, wiki documents. Uh, you might have documentation where you put in a lot of sensitive information that should only be kept for the, for the dev team. Uh, you might have detailed architecture things that you want to make sure that you you protect as well. And you might have databases with uh, information or logging and things like that. There are a lot of different places. And uh, we mentioned this is one of the use cases. There are a lot of other use cases that this uh, type of secure software can be used. And some of them do support S3. Um, as I mentioned, we're using GitLab to store some of our artifacts. Most of the uh, source code um, repository softwares I've seen usually have that, especially for the artifact, because they are very suited for, for object storage compared to how it's when you have the source code, when you do a lot of commits and you change the, the, the files regularly and you want to keep track of, of um, the history of them. So let's look a bit about how we are doing this uh, on our own. And um, the important thing here is to see that this is not changing the behavior of the developer at all. They are using the same tools and the same uh, way of working that they've always been doing. It's not a change in any way for them, how they produce the code or what kind of tools they're using and how they commit code into the service. So we are using uh, all three of the the software that exists out there for hosted uh, services like GitLab, Bitbucket, and GitHub, uh, mainly because we want to we want to verify that it works and, and test it as well. And, and we are in the need of one of them, but we're using all three of them uh, for different uh, repositories. So that is running uh, in a Linux server uh, as it would do in any way, and it has a nice CASI connected disk where it stores all the data that goes into the repository uh, when it comes to source code. So that uh, service is then connected to iSCSI to our backend. So our backend is a cluster of, of nodes that supports uh, this iSCSI uh, target. So when we commit data into GitLab or Bitbucket or GitHub, that data is then stored on that disk. And uh, as soon as it stores it on there, it doesn't, it sends it over iSCSI to the target as we saw in the, the previous picture. We get it to our backend and the backend is compressing and sh uh, microsharding that data set. Just for a quick question for you here. Uh, sure. What are the advantages of, or are there advantages of storing our code in the cloud and hosting our own platform over using a SaaS code platform offering like GitHub SaaS? Yeah, it means that we have control of the data. Uh, we are the one that keeps the data set, at least when it comes to how to reassemble it. I mean, we, we're still storing the sharded data as, as Zach was showing into these uh, vendors that we are using. We're using all of the, the four big ones. But that data that we store up there is still useless to anybody who gets it. If it's a hacker or if it's someone else that gets access to it, we still are the only one who can reassemble that source code to where it should be. So that's a big advantage from, from using any of the services. It doesn't make any difference storing that source and object code off of the Git server. You know, it's kind of a different approach. Are there any advantages to storing that and separating it from the repository itself. Yeah, it could be. I mean, the, 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 you, you need the service to, to manage the code, but then you have all the other pieces that goes into it that might be useful to store as an object, but still you need to have that service to support the, the Git part of it. So it, 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 when it comes to source code, definitely. Uh, when it comes to artifacts and things like that, as we saw in the configuration, earlier, usually they support a way to store artifacts and other things to an S3 bucket. And that means that those type of data that are is kind of a binary bundle are very suitable for object storage while source code is not. And what happens to the code? It's in microshard form. If I'm an attacker and I access one of these storage locations and I attempt to eject my malicious code, right, my hack, yeah. How does that affect the experience for the developers 
uh, or the code itself. So that means that it will end up like, like Zach was saying, we have a way of uh, uh, checking that the, the data set that is stored out on these different locations is not tampered with. Uh, we do that via a digest, uh, a SHA-256 digest that we can check that it hasn't been changed. So that's important because that means that nobody can change anything on, the, on that side uh, without, uh, but still, um, we will detect that it's been changed and therefore it, it's not a, a valid data set that is out there. And just to be clear, does any data reside on the Git server or the repository there? No, no, not, not when it comes to that. It, it's kind of a, it's like a virtual disk, I would say that it looks, it's presented there, but uh, for, the, for the Git service, but as soon as it writes and reads data, it always is uh, streamed back to the backend through that iSCSI protocol. So it, it, it's not stored there. It's just the binaries running on that service and then the rest of the data is stored in the, in the Microsoft backend. And does deploying Shard Secure, integrating Shard Secure, this micro shard technology with the code repository add, add any complexity to the deployment or management of the coding platform? Not really. I, I mean, you have to set up the iSCSI part, which is a, uh, a fairly easy way of, of adding in it. It's not different from adding iSCSI and other type of iSCSI uh, storage. And it's we have step-by-step -step guides how to do it and it's done very quickly. And uh, since it's already in both Windows and Linux, it, it's, a, it's a quick way of setting up uh, this kind of source code repositories on top of that and just adding that disk and, and make sure it stores the, the data on there. And, some of them also use some database services. So that's also one place where we, we validated that databases are running fine as well on, on this type of um, technology. But it's also important, as we mentioned, that on the right side, uh, whoever gets access to it uh, will not have a, a complete data set. It's just part of it. Uh, it will be compressed. Uh, it will be sharded. And it will not contain any, any useful data set. So when it comes to backup, which is another one, I mean, we're looking mostly at now the, the live coding or the history of the code, but you also need to take backups and they are also sensitive. And where do you store those? If you take that and store the backup uh, at a regular bucket, it means you have the same issue as if you would store source code over there. Uh, so what I mentioned we do, we use uh, the S3 API and connect our source code services. So when they do backup, they send that directly to our S3 backend. And when you do that type of data set, it's the same thing when, when, uh, when Zach was showing you the, the way that market sharding works, we talked about four byte charts, which is useful when, when you have text files or sensitive data like source code or uh, credit card information or personal private information like social security numbers. But if you have binary data, four bytes of a binary data doesn't make any sense and maybe probably not even 10 or 12 or, I mean, you can go up to maybe 512 byte shards and still that is, uh, is not containing any sensitive data because you need a whole binary data set to, to get anything out of it. Uh, so you can have different policies within the backend. So depending on what type of data you get, you can have different uh, settings on how uh, big or small the, the shard should be. And that's something we can configure in our, in our backend. Just a, a few mentions before we go into a, a, a short demo. Uh, what, what are we working on? And one big thing, uh, which is adding on top of that, uh, we talked about before is what if we uh, see that a data set that we're trying to read, a sharded data set is, is either deleted, it might be modified, it could be a ransomware that had encrypted it or something have happened to the, the storage location. It could be that it's unavailable even. Uh, it happens. Uh, what do we do? When we are adding in our issue coding, so we will have a parity data as well. So when we might lose one data set, uh, if you have four or five, if you lose one of them, we can still use the parity data to reassemble the data on the fly. And this is not something you have to uh, to be aware of or do anything about this will be uh, done at the merge process. 
So when we find something like that, and it's important now we talked about ransomware, that, that's one of the attack vector you, you could get um, some protection against as well. Uh, another part is the multi-region. Uh, currently the cluster has to be in one region uh, because it has to communicate between the nodes uh, to make sure it has the, the complete information about how to merge and, and share data. Uh, but we are looking at now for, for one specific customer asked for multi-region, so we, we're working on that. So we can have a cluster in the East Coast and a cluster in the West Coast, and they can serve the same data set uh, and we'll have a way of, uh, of um, uh, sending data in between them to make the, sure they are synchronized. I wanted to just end with a with a very short demo for you, and it's uh, a bit uh, of what uh, already Zach was showing. I will show it live to you, and um, this is the the backend UI that we have. You see, this is just a, a, a web view on top of the the, the S3 backend. So you can see these are the buckets that have been created in here for different purposes. There might be some source code buckets and backup buckets and so on, and uh, I'm using also this one, which is the CyberDuck. This is uh, using the S3 API to connect to the same backend. So if we go into this one, we see we don't have anything in the source code here. And if we look at this one, this is uh, one of the buckets I'm using in the backend to store uh, shard containers. And these are different shard containers stored that existing here. It's been data that have been uploaded to the, and you see the July 10 is the, the last one. So I'm gonna show you now, this is a, a a source code file that I have here, this one. I'm gonna to go to, let me see, here we go. I'm gonna have some sample. So this is the, the Python code inject of Python. And you see, this is the, the source code that I'm gonna push up there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this uh, Python code, and drag and drop it over here. And this is now using S3. Uh, it's stored there, it looks like it's, uh, uh, in there and it's actually been sharded now and sent to these different locations. So if I go back to my S3 bucket and refresh, we should see a new shard container file here from July 14th. And um, let's download this one. Right there. So you saw the, this is the original source code. And this is what it looks like when it's been sharded and compressed as well. You see there's nothing in here that you can find. This is only part of that data set you see on the left side, but you might see a few ones. You know, we're doing four byte charts. You might actually see some, but it's, it's obfuscating the whole thing. And it's also changing uh, and adding some poison into it. So to be able to reassemble, you have to know the exact chart size and it could be different for different uh, uh, policies, as I mentioned. And you have to also know what is poison and what is not. So it's a, a very complex way of, of uh, making sure that nobody can reassemble this, this data set. Okay, that's uh, the things I had. I think we could open up for a few minutes for a Q and A, if there's any other questions. Right, Robert. Thank you, Jesper. At this time, if you have any questions, uh, just navigate to the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar and pop your question in there. And we'll give you a minute to, to type those questions and, and pop them in. We do have a question from the chat from earlier in the presentation. The question is, can you speak to the high availability of the architecture? And the example is, what happens if the shard secure appliance goes down? Okay, I can take that. So uh, as we mentioned, we're talking about the cluster and the cluster is uh, at least uh, set up with three nodes uh, for that high availability. And even each node can support uh, any data set. So they are synchronized in between each other. It could be more than three, but three is the kind of the, the base that we do. Uh, and that means that uh, if one goes down, uh, it means that the two other ones can support it and even two can go down and the third one. If the whole cluster goes down, we have to reinitiate the cluster again, start it up again and just uh, upload the, the configuration. That's one of the things we, we don't store any sensitive data on the cluster itself for security reasons. So that's uh, uploaded during startup. So you can just start up a, a new cluster and add that in and it will be servicing the, the, the 
API again. And that, that's one of the reasons also we're doing this multi-region. It means that you can have, if one region would be inaccessible, the, there's another region who can support uh, and still uh, man, make sure that you can get the data set. Excellent. Next question. Does Shard Secure work on other code rep repositories other than GitLab? Yeah, we, we've been testing a few ones, but it should be, since we're using iSCSI, it means that pretty much anything uh, that runs on, on Linux or Windows uh, should work. If there's a specific problem, we can try it, but we, we tried the three major ones, as I mentioned. We tried GitLab, GitHub, Enterprise, and um, Bitbucket. Excellent. Uh, another question. What sort of performance overhead is there? How much longer as a percentage of time compared to normal I.O. to shard and store sharded data? The question essentially is, how does micro sharding your data affect performance? So with, with the tests we've done, uh, and it's, it's hard to tell. We, we've added in a lot of things into the product so uh, every customer can measure what performance to get out of it because it's, it's a lot uh, dependent on what type of connection you have, what type of cluster you set up and things like that. There's a lot of different uh, parts that add up to it. But in general, we can say that if you're not using compression or if the data set is, is maybe not suitable for compression, I would say, if it's a data set that is compressed as it when we get it, since we're doing uh, multiple writes and reads, we get in parity of uh, using a directly accessing an S3 bucket in AWS, for example. So that will be in parity. If we have compression, we'll actually enhance the performance a bit, depending on how much we can compress it. Because if you think about, if you have a hundred megabyte file, and if we can compress that down to say 60 megabyte, and then we spread it on to four different places, it means that we will write 15 megabytes to each of these four locations at the same time. So writing that in parallel, 15 megabytes rather than writing 100 megabytes to one single location. That's where we can get the performance to be a bit better even than, than using direct access to an S3 bucket. Excellent. The next question is, can micro sharding be applied to all types of files or just code? No, it could be any type of data set and, and both when it comes to object storage like S3, uh, as we mentioned, it could be any type of data set. Uh, but as well as if you're using iSCAS, it means that you can put anything on top of it. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It could be a service that is a database storing database files, or it could be a share where you store documents or that type of data as well. Excellent. And this next question is probably a good one for Zach. Uh, with the MicroShard engine being the central point of control, doesn't that become the weak point in the system? How is the central engine secured? Yeah, so um, I, I wouldn't call it the weak part of the system, but um, you know, we spend a lot of time securing um, securing those nodes. Um, so they're definitely um, hardened. Um, it's still part of the attack surface though. So you know, while we say we um, reduce your attack surface, we're not saying we eliminate your attack surface. So if we can remove uh, you know, all your uh, backend storage, you know, where the data actually resides at, at rest, we're reducing that attack surface. And, um, you know, certainly the, the, the cluster is, remains as, as part of that uh, attack surface. So, um, you know, we spend a lot of time hardening that and uh, in, ensure that uh, it's gonna be resistant uh, as much as possible to any types of attacks. Thank you, Zach. The next question is, is Shard Secure a SaaS service or software as a service? Uh, yeah, negative uh, to that. Um, so this is uh, software that you uh, install and deploy in your environment. The storage locations are all storage locations that you configure and they can be again, on-prem or uh, any of the major cloud providers or any mix thereof. Um, but Shard Secure as a company, it's not, uh, we do not store any of your data. We do not have any control of your data. We have no access to your data. 
Um, it is a, um, it's a software solution that you maintain 100% full control of. Uh, there is not even um, you know, any type of uh, heartbeat or callbacks to us from that appliance. You could run this in a 100% air-gapped environment uh, with, with no uh, degradation of, of service. Excellent, thank you. And, and that's it as far as questions. In closing, uh, Shard Secure's micro shard technology ensures your data at rest, including code, is always incomplete, has zero value, and contains no sensitive data at rest, effectively mitigating the risk of data breach or software supply chain attacks. Our customers use micro shard technology to compensate for the weaknesses of modern cloud data security controls, providing defense in depth for their most sensitive data in cloud storage, databases, applications, backup solutions, and code repositories. I'd like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. For more information, go to shardsecure.com or contact us for a demo to discuss how MicroShard technology can provide defense in depth for your data. Have a great day, everyone.